don't mean to be rude, but... That's okay. Okay, in five, four, three, two, one, and down. And uh, if you could just say your name and My then... name is Peter Metzlar. Tell us your story. Born in Amsterdam, Holland. And the story that I'm about to tell is from memory. The reason that I bring that up all the time is many times I forget what I had for dinner last night. But uh, yet I remember in a great amount of detail what happened so many years ago. Uh, I was born in Amsterdam, as was my father. My mother, however, was born in Austria, in Vienna, came to Holland when she was 19. And that becomes a part of the story later on of relevance. Uh, we lived in a four-story walk-up apartment in Amsterdam when the war broke out. And the first things that I happen to actually remember is looking out the window and seeing uh, Nazi German soldiers parading up and down the streets with fixed bayonets, many times rounding up people. Of course, I was at that time only seven years old and really don't recall knowing what that was all about. The one thing I do remember is that they all wore a bright yellow star on their outer garment. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, any country that Hitler occupied uh, throughout Europe, he required every single Jewish person to wear a Star of David on their chest. Within that star, it spelled the word Jew in whatever language it happens to be. And uh, it was done for two purposes. One, of course, for identification and the other for a uh, manner of dehumanizing. Picture walking down the street and you have to be identified with your belief or what you are by a tag on your coat. I wore that and every Jewish person who went out in the street was required to wear that. The question many times comes out, why not not wear it? Well, that's easier said than done. Uh, the Germans were very clever in the respect that they, every country that they occupied, they took over the seat of government. And within the records of the seat of government, as most of us were born in hospitals, uh, I don't know if it's still due to, uh, uh, appropriate today, but in those days, the parents filled out a form in the hospital. And usually on that form, it had a question of religious preference. So the thing is, they collected those. They knew who was what, and whether you were not wearing a star, if you were stopped and asked for identification papers, you already were identified as being one of those. And if you were not wearing a star, there was no tomorrow. You were sent immediately on a train to a concentration camp. So it wasn't a matter of just saying, hey, I'm not going to wear it. I have to step uh, back for just a moment on a little show and tell. And I believe it was around 1985 or 1986, my mom was still alive, lived in a small apartment in, uh, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. And on one of my visits, uh, I went through a box of photographs. Amongst the photographs, I found a picture of my mom, uh, probably aged 23, 24, something like that. And she's wearing a coat exhibiting one of these so-called stars. As I flipped the um, photograph over, there was a, a crumbling piece of paper in the back. And when I opened it up, there was this material, this actual star. And I asked her, I said, Mom, where did you get this? And she stated that she didn't know how come it lasted as long as it did. But after the war, she tore that star off her coat. And this was the actual star. I have a photograph of her wearing a picture of wearing the star. And the star next to it is the actual star that came off the coat in the Hebraic lettering form. It spells the word Jod, J-O-O-D, the Dutch word for Jew. In Germany, it was Jude, French Juf, etc. So this is a real piece of living history uh, for myself. <clears throat> One of the most memorable things that I think I recall, and I tend to get just a little bit louder at that time, only because that is what it sounded like to me as a seven-year-old, that I was awakened one night, uh, sometime after midnight, I suppose, 
with trucks pulling up in front of our apartment complex and the metal doors of the truck slamming and the thing that stuck out in my mind more than anything else and every time that I tell the story I still get goosebumps quite frankly and it's still at the night these young German soldiers yelling at the top of the top of their lungs Alle Juden raus! All Jews get out! Uh, it was followed up by doors being kicked in and breaking windows, women screaming, babies crying. They hadn't come to our door as yet at that moment. Uh, the result of that was the next day in school. A couple of my buddies were gone. What happened? Well, it wasn't really talked about. And that proceeded over a number of weeks. A couple of more of the kids disappeared. And one day mom came up to me and said that uh, uh, Aunt Katie and Uncle Leo have been arrested. They are gone. Well, what does that mean? They are gone. Well, you know, how do you explain that to a seven-year-old? Uh, she says, I will tell you one day. And it was some months later that she told me that uh, Oma and Opa, Grandma and Grandpa Metzlar, have been arrested and they are gone. Gone. What does that mean, gone? Well, again, we will tell you when you get a little older. And then came the day that she told me that dad had been arrested and he is gone. He used to like to fish, but that amongst any other occupations, hobbies was not allowed by Jews. So he went fishing one day in a little rowboat that he had. He got arrested and that is the last that we ever saw or heard of him again. Mom recognized that it was just a matter of time and our number would be up. So she got hold of the underground. In Holland, as in Belgium, as in France, after the Nazis occupied the country, a very active resistance force was formed, a so-called so -called underground. Uh, those people were just normal, everyday citizens whose attitude basically was, who are these people coming across our border, arresting our citizens? Uh, they would get hold of food stamps, which everybody had to have, but they were not issued to the Jews. They got hold of food for those that could not buy food. Uh, falsification of papers, identification papers. <clears throat> and more than anything else, as important, if not more so than anything else, find places or people that would be willing to shelter or hide a Jewish person or persons. So it came about that the underground got hold of a couple in the northeastern part of Holland on a very, very small farm, Klaas and Rofina Post. They were willing to give mom and I shelter. Through the years, it always astounded me what these people did, because they lived on a small farm. Their only means of sustenance was what they grew on the farm. The entire farm constituted of a couple of cows, a couple of chickens, a couple of pigs. That was it. They lived on what they could raise on the small amount of land that they had. And yet, with these small halves, they were willing to share this with two total strangers. As I got older, I recognized even more so, not only were they willing to share these, these meager halves they had, but doing what they did meant that they were risking their lives and their entire family's lives. Because should the Germans capture us or find out that they were hiding us, not only would that be the end of us, but it would be the end of Klaus and Rufina, as well as their entire, entire family. They would be shipped to a concentration camp. So it was always quite, quite uh, amazing what they did. <clears throat> it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Klaus knew that my father and most of my family were gone. Uh, he used to sit me on his knee many times and sing a song, and he really be kind of became like a surrogate dad to me. Uh, very, very warm, warm and compassionate people. Uh, being a city kid, of course, I had to get accustomed to life on the farm, except the fact that I was not allowed to come out during daylight hours, except when it started toward dusk. 
uh, in fear of being identified or seen by somebody else in the area. Mom never came out during the day at all. But toward dusk, I used to help him and spread the manure on the, on the farmland, something, of course, as a city kid I wasn't used to, but got used to quite, quite readily. Uh, I used to help him around the farm, picking up some eggs from chickens, which was quite, a, quite an adventure. And the same raids that I described earlier, where they came in the middle of the night, started to happen on the farmlands. The Nazis started to find out that many of the farmers were hiding Jews. So now these trucks used to come up to the farms, ransack those farms, convinced and many times finding persons in hiding. Sometimes with fixed bayonets, running it through haystacks where people were hiding. Uh, it was, became a very frightening situation and uh, Klaus called mom and I over one day <clears throat> and in one of the tiny little bedrooms he had cut out a couple of planks, a couple of 12 inch wide planks by 6 feet long out of the floor. 8, 10, 12 inches below was just the uh, old dirt. And now when we had forewarning or heard the trucks coming down the dirt road, mom and I would run into this <clears throat> bedroom open up these planks and jump in there uh, like a couple of sardines. Klaus or Rufina would put the planks back on, uh, throw a little rug over it, put a chair or a table on it, and you couldn't tell anything had happened over there. And there were numerous occasions that mom and I were in there, as I said, like a couple of sardines, with the soldiers ransacking the farmhouse, walking six inches above our head, uh, all it would have taken is one sneeze, one cough, one hiccup. It would have been all over. Uh, even that got to be too dangerous. Right next to the farm was a very small forest, probably not more than a half an acre, if that. Nobody ever went in there. And one day, Klaus told me to get a wheelbarrow toward dusk, again toward evening, and a couple of shovels, and we went into this little forest. He told me to start digging into this rise into the forest floor, so to speak and put all the dirt on, onto a wheelbarrow. Every time that the wheelbarrow was filled, he told me to go in the area 30, 40, 50 feet away, and one hand at a time to spread the dirt around. Do not leave a pile. Do not let it be shown that there was any activity here. So after a couple of days of digging, we ended up with a uh, hole in the ground, three by three by six feet, uh, a cave, if you will. Klaus cut out of the area some small trees that he made a roof over this hole. <clears throat> he made a trap door in front, uh, made it out of twigs, and you could stand in front of this thing and never even know there was any activity there, whatever. And now again, when the trucks came down the road, Mom and I would run out the back of the farm, and we would hide uh, into this, uh, in this cave. Uh, we would just barely fit in the two of us. And I remember many, many times a very scary experience. Sometimes dirt came trickling down the side. I was always fearful if that thing might cave in. But more than anything else, I think I became aware by this time I'm nine years old, nine and a half years old, and I came aware of the fact that we were hunted. And although we were in this cave, it was maybe 150, 200 feet away from the farmhouse itself, we could hear the German soldiers hollering, convinced somebody was being hidden on that, uh, on that farmhouse, except we couldn't look out. And there was always this frightening feeling of, is it this time they're going to come and find us? Are they going to come to the forest and find our hiding place? It was extremely, extremely frightening because you couldn't see anything and it was this unknown. By this time, I was aware that our lives were being threatened most of the time. Uh, in the beginning of uh, 1943, the Allies, the British, and the Americans started to run bombing raids from Great Britain over to England in order to wipe out the Nazi war machine, the factories and so forth, munitions factories. Uh, the little farm that we were on was only about 25 miles from the German border. The entire Dutch border, eastern Dutch border, of course, borders the western border of Germany. And when those bombers came over, 
it scared the living daylights out of me. They were B-17, four-engine, heavy bombers. They would fly at extremely high altitude. When you looked up, all you could see is a pinhead, but you could see all these vapor trails, and they used to come up 50, 60 at a time. The drone of those bombers, I cannot describe. It scared the living daylights out of me. The ground would shake, the windows would rattle. It was a very, very scary experience. Needless to say, when they came over, it would only be a matter of 15 minutes and they would be over German territory. And they would have to lower an altitude in order to drop their bomb load. And many of the American B-17 bombers got shot down. Many American lives were lost. So the General High Command in Great Britain uh, decided to run these raids at night, hoping to elude some of the anti-aircraft fire whereby they lost many, many lives and, and planes. Well, that particular experience was even more frightening. You could hear uh, several minutes before they came, again, this drone, this loud, loud drone of all these heavy bombers coming over, the ground shaking, the windows rattling. Except what made it even more frightening, you could, if you were outside, look up in the sky and you didn't see anything. Well, on one of those early bombing raids, uh, we could hear him come, and I got very frightened. I had to go to the bathroom. This little farmhouse, when Mom and I got there, probably at that time already was 50, 60 years old. There was virtually no indoor plumbing. It was like an outhouse if you had to go use the toilet. Those bombers came over, the noise started, everything started to rattle, and I had to go to the bathroom, but I was too afraid to go out by myself. So I asked Mom to take me out, this was, of course, it was all dark during the night. She was willing to, of course, accommodate. As we stepped outside, the drone of those bombers became just deafening. And it was all dirt around the farm. And just so I wouldn't trip over my own two feet, mom had a little flashlight that she turned on just so I could tell where I was going. It was at that time, which of course I didn't understand this behavior, that when she turned on that flashlight, I screamed at the top of my lungs and I hit her. I punched her. It took as I got older, basically, I suppose you can call it Psych 101, that what, what meaning did this have? She was only trying to help me. Well, when she turned on that light in the mind of a nine and a half year old, I was convinced a bomb was going to come right down that flashlight. And that was basically the explanation, as I recognized it many years later. <clears throat> Mom and I were on this farm for two, little over two years. And we withstood many, many raids. But again, Mom recognized that it was just a matter of time. And we either would be discovered and deported. But not only would that be the end of us, but once again, it would be the end of this wonderful family, Klaus and Rufina, and their extended family. So my mom felt we had to find a different hiding place. How, I don't recall, I don't know, but she once again got hold of the underground. They found a couple of ladies in the city of The Hague, which is, of course, the seat of government in Holland. How we got over there, I don't know, I don't recall. But we got over there, they lived in a three, four story walk-up apartment, and they were willing to let us use one of their small bedrooms. When we got over there, it was a whole different ball game from what we were used to. The sharing of food didn't exist, what we experienced on the farm. The humanity, the kindness of Klaus and Rafina didn't exist. I do not know, I am only making a supposition, I do not know this, that maybe my mom had saved up some money and these ladies gave us shelter for a price because, again, they didn't share anything. They wouldn't even talk to us. Uh, they wouldn't help us get stamps for food. And they made my mom scrub floors and do a lot of dirty work. But we had to be thankful. They did give us shelter. We were there for about a month. And then my mom came out with a word that I hadn't heard in well over two years. It scared me. And she says, Peter, you haven't been to school for over two years. School? How can I go to school? I'm one of them. I'm one of the hunted. How can I go to school? 
She says, well, get used to something. We got some false papers for you. And you're not Peter Metzelar anymore. From now on, you're Peter Pelt. No idea who this guy was, Peter Pelt. But with this new name, I went to school. A very, very frightening experience. It was, of course, all psychologically. It was all in my head, but I felt like every kid knew what, what I was. Again, this feeling of constantly knowing, of being hunted. I was so afraid of being discovered. Of course, the kids had no idea what I was or who I was. I was just one of the kids. But it was after over two years of, of hiding and now being in a public, man, in a public environment that that fear always was a part of me. At the end of the first semester, or first quarter, I don't know, we got a report book. And uh, these were the grades. In those days, they didn't have the printouts like they do, I'm sure, nowadays. But it was a little thing called a report book, a report book. It still has the name Peter Pelt on it. Within that, it had the uh, various subjects uh, that were taught. And next to it, they had a numerical way of grading. Instead of A, Bs, and Cs, it was like uh, tens, nines, eights, and so forth. And it was all alongside the, uh, the grades were put next to that. On that first semester, I got my first grades. And I only go show that very slowly, very slowly, because it wasn't very good. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the two worst grades that I had, that I almost flunked, were in behavior and Bible studies. Those were the flunky grades. Uh, something that a lot of people may not be aware of, but as a point of history, Nazi Germany was the first country on this planet to develop a ballistic missile for war purposes. It was referred to as a V-2 rocket. It was about a 65 foot tall rocket where they put on whatever 500,000 pound explosives. They build about a half a dozen launching pads around the city of The Hague and they fired these rockets over to England. The unfortunate thing was that Hitler was in such a hurry to implement the use of these rockets that he did so prior to these things being totally tested. This is actually a picture of an actual V-2 rocket being fired up and on the, on the launching pad. And the reason that I mentioned <clears throat> that he put that in operation prior to these things truly being tested is that when they fired one of these things up, it's like us watching the shuttle go up, a tremendous amount of smoke over the city, a tremendous roar, very loud. It would last 25, 30 seconds. The noise would disappear as the rocket would head over the English Channel to Great Britain. Many, many of them got there, killing hundreds and hundreds of, of Brits, uh, doing a lot of damage in, in, in London and other cities. However, close to 50% of these rockets, because they had not been tested, never made it over there. You could hear this roar, see the smoke over the city, and after 20, 30 seconds, all of a sudden, dead silence, and you better duck. Because once again, one of those rocket engines failed and that thing came crashing down on the city of The Hague. By the end of the war, a city of about 250,000 populace, about a third of the city was destroyed by these failed rockets that never, never made it over to England. <clears throat> In 19, the latter part of 1943, uh, there was, Hitler called a conference in a city south of Berlin called the One Sea Conference in the city of Wannsee, where he put together all of his henchmen. And it was there, it was there that they uh, actually came up with the so-called final solution. How to eradicate every Jewish person from the city, uh, from Europe. It was at that particular time that these raids that I had described before became 24-7, every single day, every single day, 24-7, door to door. Do you want, I'm sorry, do you want to stop this for a second? Yeah, we can wait till that's over. Okay. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, there's one more thing, an important thing that I forgot, but there was the British used to come over when we lived in The Hague and I explained where the launching pads, uh, the, the V-2 rockets were fired over to England. Well, two, three times a week the British used to come over and try to wipe out those rocket bases. Again, they used to be intercepted by the Luftwaffe. Dog fights ensued. And one of the things that the kids used to do, in those days there is no such thing, probably not even today, as what we have in America called trading cards. You trade, you know, NFL cards and hockey league cards and so forth, and the kid will hear trade, you know, a Joe DiMaggio for blah, 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 whatever. No such thing existed in Europe then, but let it be up to the guys, the young fellas during war. And what was that? After the British used to come over and be intercepted, there were dogfights. After the dogfights, you could walk on the street and the kids used to collect shrapnel, blown up pieces of ammunition that they used to trade in school the next day. Hey, Charlie, take a look at this funny one. I'll trade you for two of those, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, one day my mom took me out. And by the way, I have some of these pieces of shrapnel. It is pretty frightening to look at. These are actual pieces of shrapnel that I got uh, from a, a veteran from Holland who had saved that. These are blown up pieces of ammunition that, you know, needless to say, will shred somebody to pieces. And the kids traded. We traded. Hey, I'll trade you these two for this one, blah, 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 blah. Well, one day my mother was courageous enough and we went to a park very close to where we were living. No sooner do we get to the park and the air raid siren sounded. The British were on the way. We went into the air raid shelter. We could hear the machine guns, all the racket. 45 minutes later, the all clear sounded and as we walked out, I was holding my mom's hand. Of all the crazy things to remember, I was wearing red knobby gloves. It was on a Sunday, school the next day, so I'm walking with my head down looking for pieces of shrapnel to collect and to trade. As we walk down the road, I look ahead 20 feet, and there I see a piece of shrapnel the likes of which I'd never seen before. It was huge. I pulled away from mom, and I picked this thing up, and the two things I remember, it was heavy, it took two hands to pick it up, but with my red knobby gloves, heat actually came through my gloves. I was so proud of this because I was going to be the big shot in school the next day. Anybody wanting to trade for this thing, they'd have to give me every piece that they ever collected. I picked it up and I showed it to mom. I was so proud of it. She takes one look at it, puts her hand under my hand that was holding this shrapnel and makes me heave it away. I just about started to cry when there's an explosion behind me. There's a crater in the street. Whatever it was I picked up, it was live. It blew up. And the only regret that I had afterwards, I wouldn't be the big shot in school the next day. I didn't have to trade. Of course, had she not d done this, you would never heard this story. <laughs> that's, <laughs> worth, that's worth including. OK. Yeah. We're, okay, we're going. Okay. Every uh, day on a 24-7, those raids to pick up the Jewish people, grandfathers, old people, young people, women with babies, were routed out of their apartments or living quarters, rounded into trucks, and who knows where they went to. They didn't know where they went to. The story, of course, was, we're going to relocate you. Don't worry, you'll be together with your family again. Well, since those raids became so, so prevalent, how I do not know, my mother found out that the ladies that were giving us shelter got scared, and my mother found out that they were going to turn us in. They were too afraid of being caught with us, and the results, needless to say, would be death for them as well. So they were going to turn us in, and once again, we had to get out of there. How, again, I do not know, but mom once again got hold of the underground and they found a one-room apartment back in the city of Amsterdam where we started originally, where I was born. The question was, how do we get there? Well, one night I wake up, and it must have been sometime after midnight, and when I woke up, my mom is sitting on a small table with a candle, uh, by candlelight, what appeared to me a bunch of sheets that she's sewing. 
And as she sewed for a bigger period of time, she ended up with a skirt with some pockets on it. She wrapped around herself. She kept sewing, and she ended up with a top with pockets and buttons on it. She put that over her, over the clothes she was wearing. Then she had a piece of cardboard that she wrapped into this white sheet material. And she had some red material that she made a cross out of that she put on, sewed it on there. She made a nurse's uniform. I had no idea what that was all about. But sometime maybe at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, she wrapped this around herself, bundled me up. We had virtually no belongings. And we tippy-toed down the apartment uh, out in the street. I had no idea where we were going. It was winter. It was had several feet of snow. And it was a frightening, frightening experience because who walks out at 2.30 in the morning in the snow, let alone who we were? So we went in the shadows of buildings and alleyways, and I had no idea where we were going. The reality was that in those days there was one highway connecting the city of The Hague, the city of The Hague and Amsterdam, only one highway. The distance wasn't far, maybe 40, 50 miles. However, that highway was only to be used by the German Nazi uh, military. No civilians allowed. What are we doing? How are we going to get? There were no bicycles. There was no public transportation. This highway was only to be used by the Nazis. I couldn't imagine that's where we would be heading, but we did. As daylight started to come up and we, our toes were frozen, we'd probably walked three, four miles through the snow, I recognized all of a sudden that we're heading for this highway. By this time, I'm 10 years old, and I have a pretty good idea what is happening here. As we get closer, we could see in the distance soldiers marching, tanks, flatbed trucks, heavy artillery, and we're heading for the lion's den. I was hanging on to mom for dear life. I had no idea what was going to happen next, but we headed for this highway. When we got to the highway with all this German might, our enemy, the people that were going to kill us, we get to the highway and my mom turns sideways and puts up the hitchhike sign. She starts to hitchhike. I couldn't believe my eyes. I hung on to her for dear life. What is she doing? It wasn't but a few minutes later that a big flatbed truck stopped. A Nazi SS officer stormed out of the cab and started to read my mother the riot act. What are you doing here? This is for the fatherland. No civilians allowed. What are you doing with a child? Blah, 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 blah. As I mentioned in the beginning of the story, my mom was born in Vienna, Austria, and of course spoke and understood fluent German. For some reason, this Nazi officer decided to give my mom an excuse to tell her story. What is she doing as a civilian along this highway with a child? Her story was this. You know about the British, who used to come over, by the way, several times a week to try and wipe out those launching pads of those V2s. It entailed dogfights. They used to be intercepted by the Wehrmacht, excuse me, by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, and dogfights would ensue, and bombs dropped, and so forth. And mom said to the Nazi officer, you know about those British coming over trying to bomb the Shah? Yeah, yeah, ich weiß das, I know that. Well, just the day before yesterday, where this kid lived, one of the British bombs went astray and hit the apartment complex that the kid here was living in, and it killed both his father and mother. Ach, so Frau, is that right, madam? She says, as you can see, I work for the International Red Cross. I'm a nurse, and I'm taking him to a orphanage, an orphanage in Amsterdam. Kommen Sie mit mir. Come with me, ma'am. He guided mom over to the truck, helped her into the truck, 
came to me and lifted me up in the flatbed part in the snow. He went back in the truck. My mom sat between the two SS officers. I sat on the flatbed truck in the snow. And thank you very much. They took us to Amsterdam. Uh, just unbelievable for me to think back of those. What the love of a mother, the determination, the cunning for the love of a child that she came up with. When we got to Amsterdam, <clears throat> one of the first things that I noticed was the fact that uh, all the trees were cut down. People had no firewood. It was cold. Winters are cold in Holland. There was nothing to cook. People, if they had some firewood, they could boil some water and dip a potato or a turnip in it and, and call it soup if they had that. But there was no wood. About two, three blocks from the apartment that we lived in was an old high school that was used by the German Wehrmacht, one of their headquarters of the German army. The British came over one day and flattened the place. The next day there was a block long of rubble. Well, it was an old school and amongst the rubble there were just many, many areas of splintered wood, of broken wood, exploded wood, whatever. And the next day dozens and dozens and dozens of people, me included, with anything that could hold a piece of wood or could cut a piece of wood, chisels, hammers, whatever, saws, axes, people chopping away to pick up these little pieces of wood. It must have been maybe 15, 20 minutes that everybody was on this rubble a block long and all of a sudden everybody got up and ran away. I did too, I didn't know why. I did find out later that some uh, Nazi officers were coming down and I suppose inspect what used to be one of their headquarters and you better not get caught. After they left, everybody went back, as did I. A similar situation arose about 10, 15 minutes later. Everybody got up and ran away, except me. I didn't see the people run away, but I did notice looking up ahead, maybe 20, 30 feet, a neighbor that I recognized who lived next door to us tried to tell me, run, go away, run, run. And then she gets up and she takes off. I didn't know what she was talking about and I suppose I had some juicy two by four I was working on, I wasn't going anywhere. And as soon as she turns around and runs away, I feel myself being grabbed by the collar and I'm dangling on the fist of a Nazi officer. As I mentioned, when we were on the farm, I had food. It was shared by Klaus and Rufina. I was never hungry. But for that almost a year that we were in The Hague, food, we had to beg, borrow, and steal. I was very, very undernourished, skinny little runt. And while I was dangling on the fist of this Nazi officer, he told me in German, and don't ask, I understand even to this day, I can understand German, I speak some German. But he told me while I was dangling on his fist that he would give me 10 seconds or he would shoot me. And he pulled out his revolver. Well, when he dropped me, when he let me go with my undernourished skinny little legs, uh, I could have won the Olympic gold. You never saw a skinny kid run so fast. The sad part about this was the lady that tried to hustle me out of the way, our neighbor, went over to the apartment, knocked on mom's door, and told her, Ellie, I don't know how to tell you this, but I witnessed it. They got Peter. I just cannot imagine, and it upsets me even talking about it now, how mom must have felt. The one thing that she was living for the one thing for four years that she tried to protect after losing everybody and now finding out that I was a goner. I compounded that problem by being streetwise and instead of running straight home, uh, I was too afraid to do that because I was afraid I would be followed. So I took, instead of being back in the 10 minutes, I went through people's backyards and alleys and it took me a half an hour to get home. When I knocked on the door, mom opened up the door. She was still hysterical. As I recall, it was quite a reunion.
it was probably the first time that I ever recall her showing emotion to the extent that she did, thinking that I was a goner and here I was again. It was on May 14, 1945, that the Canadians liberated Holland. The war was over. Nobody in my family returned. Mom and I were the only survivors. Three years later, in 1948, Mom remarried. And a year after that, in March of 1949, we came to the United States. I was 13 and a half years old. Because of my age, we came, I mean, we came to New York. And because of my age, they put me in the eighth grade. That was fine uh, with one slight problem, that being I didn't speak nor understood a word of English. A little, little tough in being in school. But on the humorous side of things, I do recall uh, a couple of incidents in the eighth grade, and that was that in those days, and maybe even today, I don't know, but in those days for sure, the young kids were a lot more reserved in Europe than they were in the United States. Uh, maybe more respectful to elders, uh, not as outgoing. And the thing that I couldn't get used to was these forward, young, beautiful girls making a big to-do out of this, this kid from Holland. Well, I have to say I had a lot of hair. I was a cute guy. <laughs> I understood that. And they used to ask me, are you the one? Are you the one that saved the country by putting his finger in the dike? I didn't know what they were talking about. That's an American-made story. I never heard about that in Holland. That's, that was made in America. And then I recall one day, uh, it was uh, Valentine's Day, and a lot of these cute, giggly girls giving me cards, Valentine's cards, which was very nice. Except what in the heck is Valentine's Day? I never heard of that before. We were in New York. And in those, at that time, there was a, in 1949, a polio epidemic in New York City. So my mom and her then husband sent me to a summer camp after school let out. And I was there for about a month. And it's amazing that probably a good part of my English was learned there. Uh, it's something that you learn faster when playing with kids than you do in, in, in a uh, study environment, in a book. But I do remember one particular embarrassing situation that uh, every day we used to play baseball and I was not familiar with the game of baseball. And every time that I came to bat, uh, I struck out. And I used to be so embarrassed by this, I knew I was bad. And just to save face, knowing I was bad, every time I struck out, I would say, I'm getting badder and badder. And a kid, I remember saying, no, you're not getting better, you're getting worse. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm bad, so I'm getting badder. I mean, that was my English to the extent that I knew it. Uh, we were in New York for probably about seven, eight months, and then came to the West Coast, uh, to the Los Angeles area. In 1950, I remember being in the ninth grade, and I had one particular incident that I always get a kick out of. Uh, <clears throat> in... Uh, those days, the shoe manufacturers, and for the older folks, they may remember that. The young kids, of course, don't. But in those days, the shoe manufacturers used to make shoes with a material. The soles were made of a material called crepe. It was a soft, spongy, rubbery material. And uh, one day, I was late for class. And as I walked into class, the bell had rung already. Uh, the teacher said, Peter, please try and be on time the next time. The bell has rung, you're late. But I appreciate you being so quiet and not to disturb the rest of the class. And I said, that's because of the crap on my shoes. Crap, crepe, it all sounded the same to me. I mean, that was my, the extent of, uh, extent of my English. As I got into high school in Los Angeles, uh, my friends, people knew my background to some degree, but I never talked about it. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, again, Psych 101, it was almost a feeling of, eh, doesn't every kid go through that? What's, what's the big deal? I never talked talk very much about it. A lot of my friends knew little pieces here, little pieces there. But all of that changed in years later. In October of 1992, all that changed. My middle son, Larry, 
he and his wife were sent to Brussels, Belgium uh, because of his work. Uh, he had to be out there for about two years. And around October of 92, I got a call from Larry and saying, why don't you guys come over here <clears throat> during the Christmas holidays? You can use our car and twiddle around Europe. Well, I was really excited about this. This is 1992. I left Holland in 1949. You know, we're talking about around 50 years. I hadn't been back yet. I still spoke the language a little bit. I had so many memories, of course. And the minute that Larry invited me, my first thought, of course, was I wanted to visit Holland. Well, you know, the southern border of Holland, of course, borders the northern border of Belgium. The two capitals, Brussels in, uh, in, in, uh, in Belgium and Amsterdam in Holland, they're only about a two and a half hour drive. The distances aren't what they are here in the United States. And I couldn't wait to go to Holland. But the thing, more importantly, that had bugged me all these years, and I had thought about it so many times, whatever happened to those dear people, Klaus and Rufina Post, who really saved our lives? Well, my mom had gotten quite ill, and uh, she was in a nursing home. And I went to the nursing home explaining to her that we were going to go to Europe and that I would like to see if I could visit or if maybe find that farmhouse if it still existed. But I had no idea where this farmhouse was, what village, was, what town, no idea. And I asked mom, she didn't remember. All she remembered the name of the dirt road, the Feeneburen. And I, when she mentioned that name, I recalled that was the name of the dirt road. I said, you know, I can't go to Europe, to a foreign country, and ask for a dirt road. What was the name of the village? She didn't know. That night, I went to the library, got an atlas, looked at all these funny names. Nothing jumped out at me. There was one name, Makinga, that had eh, ever so slight of familiarity, but it didn't jump out at me at all. The next day I went back to mom, to the nursing home. I said, were we in this village? Was there, a, is, is Makinga sound familiar? No, she didn't recall. That's all we had to go on. We flew over, B and I, my wife, and I flew over to Europe, went to Brussels, stayed with Larry and Kristen, his wife, and I had a wonderful time. They showed us around Brussels, beautiful city. And after we were there for several days, we decided uh, we're going to drive to Holland. It was only about a two and a half hour drive, and uh, we went in Amsterdam. We stayed in one of the old buildings along one of the famous canals in Holland. We became the tourists, of course, visiting the Anne Frank House and the Rijksmuseum, wonderful work of art. And while we were in Amsterdam, everything looked so familiar to me. I mean, it's an old, old city and not much has changed. The one thing that did change, I never remembered when I was a kid seeing the golden arches of McDonald's. That was kind of foreign downtown Amsterdam. But it was just wonderful. There's so much I still could understand, some of the language, some of the people were speaking. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And after we were there a couple of days, I told Larry, I said, listen, it's probably another hour's drive. I said, you sure we should go looking for this Makinga? Because it really didn't jump out at me, and Mom didn't know about it. He said, look, you know, we're here already, why not? We drive up there, and here's the sign on the highway, Makinga. We drive into this little village, and on the corner is a small bank, Robo Bank. Remember the name. And I told Larry, I said, pull up to the bank. He was driving. I says, no doubt somebody speaks English, as most people in Holland do. But in the province of Friesland, uh, they have their own dialect. Most Dutch people don't understand people in that neck of the woods. So we stopped in there. And I felt totally stupid. What am I going to do? Mr. Big Shot coming from America and going over there and asking for a dirt road. We walk into the bank and the lady says, can I help you? And I said, do you speak English? She says, yes. I said, have you ever heard of a dirt road by the name of the Feenebüren? It felt so awkward to me, so awkward that I was ready to turn around and tuck my tail between my legs and walk out. I knew sooner get the question out of the mouth 
And she said, well, of course, sir. She says, it's about three minutes from here. I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is unbelievable. It was such an emotional feeling to, number one, not, rec not being aware that I was where I didn't know I was, to having actually found it, but in addition to step back into my history of 50 years. All four of us, my daughter-in-law, my son, my wife and I, we were hugging, we were crying. It was a very, very emotional, emotional experience. The manager came out with all the records we made. I guess maybe he thought there was a holdup or something. And he asked us to come into his office. He spoke some English. I spoke some Dutch. And I told him as briefly as I could my story. He had a very pensive look on his face, I suppose, anticipating my following questions. And it got to the point where I asked him, I said, have you ever heard of the class or Rufina Post family? And he said, well, of course. I said, no kidding. He says, they used to bank here. I had had dinner with them before. I said, no. I said, what happened to those dear people? Then he came out with something that I guess I will live with the rest of my life, a feeling of regret, an awful, awful, awful feeling that I will never get over. Because I asked him what happened to them, and he says they both passed away about nine years ago. And as I always explain when I do my talk to kids, you know, if there's anything important, to somebody that you care about that you need to say, say it. You may never get a chance and to live with regret is just an awful, awful feeling. And I will always have to live with that. Anyway, he drew a little map of the farmhouse. He didn't know who was living there now. He said, I'm sure whoever is there uh, <clears throat> will let you in. We drove a few minutes. We came to that street, uh, dirt road sign, the Feineburen, the name that my mother remembered. She always told me one time when I asked about it originally, why do you want to go there? It's probably got uh, parking lots and malls and all of that. Well, there was no parking lots, no malls, same old dirt road. As we hobbled over the bumps in, of the dirt road about a quarter of a mile, I looked out, Larry was driving, and I said, oh my heavens. I said, there it is. There was no doubt in my mind. The little farmhouse, no doubt a new roof, new paint, but there it was. Unfortunately, nobody was home. Nobody was home, we couldn't go inside. We spent hours walking around there, and all of a sudden it felt like I was seven and a half years old again. It's like I never left there. It, it just felt, felt right, yet frightening. It, it was hard, hard to describe. I even have a picture that my wife took of me in front of the door, that we stood, that I stood so many years ago uh, with the bombers coming over, my mom trying to help, me screaming at her and hitting her when she turned on the flashlight. On the same step, on the same front door. It was just incredible. Uh, it was winter, it was in the middle of December, and uh, the little forest where the cave that I helped build with Klaas, I wanted to go in there to see if there might have been a remnant of a soft spot in the ground where that cave used to be. We walked over, walked over there. It was crunchy with snow and ice, no leaves on the trees. And I don't know for what reason, but we somehow split up. The family went one way, I went another way. I had a video camera with me, and I was stepping on any rise in the ground to see if there was a soft spot, talking into the camera. I wonder if this is where the, where the cave was. Uh, I came upon two tree stumps that were about eight feet apart. Uh, they were all gray, so I knew they had been cut down a long, long time ago. And as I'm videotaping it, I said, I wouldn't be surprised if this is where the cave was. I know soon I get those words out of my mouth, and about 50, 70 feet away, my son Larry calls out, Dad, come here, I found it. I go over there, and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was that cave, like the day I left it, 50 some odd years ago. Absolutely unbelievable. I have a picture here of the sign coming into the town 
welcome Makincha and me looking into the cave, looking inside where mom and I so many years ago hid. At the bottom picture, before we left, uh, this one over here, I had a, uh, sorry, this one right over here, I had a small screwdriver on my keychain and I carved in one of the small tree trunks over there, over the roof, E and P for Ellie and Peter. It was just absolutely unbelievable to find this particular place after so many years. After we left there, we did something that I had wanted to do for many, many years. And people used to say, why do you want to do this? You're some kind of a nut. And I said, no, I don't know. I do. And what that was is that if I had the opportunity, I wanted to visit the site of a former Nazi concentration camp. After we drove back to uh, Brussels from the farm, from Makinja, two days later, Larry had made some arrangements and we flew to the city of Krakow, Krakow in Poland. A beautiful medieval city, but a half, a, a half an hour outside of the city, it had the most infamous of the Nazi concentration camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau. I don't want to go at this point into all of the details, but it was a sobering feeling to walk through the tunnel that so many hundreds of thousands of people went through on their cattle cars, barely surviving, being fed into the gas chambers that you can actually still walk through. There are a couple of them that the Nazis didn't blow up, where you can actually get the feeling what that must have been like. So the bottom line is, after we get back, the question many times comes up, you know, what has changed from those days to today? It is my personal opinion that not much has changed. The times are different. The ways of killing are different. And whether it's uh, here in Africa, whether it's the, the discrepancies that take place in this country, the hatred that is still in different parts of the world, world uh, not much has changed. We're still trying to convince somebody who is different, whether they pray different, whether they don't pray, whether they black, white, different, whether they have a profession or they don't, whether they're tall, small. People are trying to convince that they are the ones that are right. So the bottom line is that we have to recognize the festering of hatred, to recognize the young people, especially when things that led up to this horrible thing called the Holocaust, that that is leading up to similar holocausts. And there's no doubt, but there have been holocausts since. Maybe not on the scale of the holocaust, of the, what was happening to the Jews relative to what the German Nazis did. But in a smaller scale, uh, the definition of holocaust, one of the definition is the total destruction of people by fire. Well, don't tell me that 9-11 in its own wasn't the Holocaust. Again, it wasn't the six million people that got wiped out, it was 3,000. But if you take that definition, the total destruction of people by fire, it certainly can fill in the definition of Holocaust. So the bottom line is this, we have to be aware of propaganda. The propaganda that we're faced every single day, where the propaganda constitute an inch of truth with three feet of lies. But we have to inform ourselves. We have to see news, evaluate news, research it, and not just believe what somebody says necessarily, to evaluate. I'd like to give one very quick example before I end my story. This is just a perfect example. The military, of which I was part of for two years when I got drafted in 1958. But the military is a society within a society. It has its own lingo. And most people are familiar with the lingo, but it is designed, really. It is designed not to create the reality of the horrors associated with it. An example, some people may recall during the first Gulf, Gulf War where the generals came up and they used to say, we ran 400 sorties today. Well, that's a normal military term, a sortie, but it's a bombing raid. But a sortie doesn't sound quite as bad as a bombing raid. And of course, during those raids, they used to drop ordnance. That's what the military calls it, ordnance. 
And it's bombs. It's the thing that kills people. Babies, old people, all people. No discrimination there at all. And then the reality of something, that some people are familiar with this. But in the Seattle Times, dated of Sunday, May 30th, 2004, and those people familiar with football, there was a gentleman by the name of Pat Tillman who had just signed a multi-million dollar professional contract with the, one of the professional NFL leagues. But after he signed, he decided to be patriotic and go into the military. He was sent to, this, to Afghanistan, and six weeks later, he got his brains blown out. But this is what I mean about the distortion of reality. The paper read, friendly fire, friendly fire blamed in the death of NFL soldier turned, NFL player turned soldier. Think about it, friendly fire. We all know what it means. His brains got blown out by one of his own. But how can it be called friendly? His child will never know who his father was. His parents will never see their son again. So we have to recognize what is real. So in my personal opinion, no matter which country you live in, we have a lot to be thankful for here. But no matter where in the world you live, again, this is my personal opinion, including the United States, it should not be my country, right or wrong. If it is right, it needs to be supported. If it is wrong, let's try and fix it.